Praise the Lord, saints. We give God praise. We give him thanks. We give him the honor and the glory because of his mercy. <clears throat> I am grateful to God because of all that he is doing and what he is yet about to do. So may God be with us as we go into this lesson tonight. And as it was mentioned, somewhere along the line there is a problem, but we'll get that together. Going, growing in God's Holy Spirit. I'm thanking God for the opportunity to share this with you tonight. And may his blessing rest upon us all and may his face shine upon us and give us the strength to be able to overcome and to do all that he has for us to do. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray tonight. Have thine own way, Lord, and hear and answer us. Guide us as we go along this journey in the name of Jesus. We thank God for this opportunity. We thank God for the opportunity privilege to be able to share in his word tonight. Tonight is a very special night as we look into our lessons. What we are going to see here as we deal with the fruits of the spirit, there is a question. And the question is, what does the Bible say about the fruits of the spirit? It will take us into some lessons that many a times we never really go into, or we read and just override it. But tonight we want to be here, we want to be ready, we want to, to be able to do all that God has for us to do and to share this message of faith and this message of love. So the lesson is really headlined from, from Galatians 5, from the 22nd verse, walking in the spirit. I want to take this from a different point of view tonight. So that as we look into it, you will see what I'm trying to share with you or what the Bible is saying to us. It's not a matter of what I am sharing, but it's what the Bible is saying to us. So let's look carefully. As Paul began to write in such a prolific way, in a way that sometimes we do not really understand what is really being said or what is being done. So let's look again. Paul said here the fruits of the, the fruit, not fruits, not plural, but the fruit of the spirit. And he began to give us nine areas of grace. I want to consider that. The but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, and peace. Long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such, there is no law. Where there is love, there is no law. To the point where one will even die for. And that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for us because of the love that he had for us. So when we begin to look at the fruit of the Spirit, which is an emblem of a Christian character, this is the emblem, the fruit of the spirit here as we begin to get into them and define them, seek to define them, to break them down. You would realize it's but the emblem of a Christian character. And sometimes the people of the world, never mind the things that they may be doing to get ahead, sometimes they share more love to those who are not than those who are off the fruit of the Spirit. We have to be very careful with this as we look into here. So again, I say to you, the fruit of the Spirit is not a mere moral or legal character. You know, well, this is a good person, and that is a good person, and you know, we continue to go like that. No, it's not just a mere moral or legal correctness. Not only character, but correctness. You know, well, I, I, I'm a good person. You know, I help those who need help. I reach out where needs to be reached out. But are you doing this with the love of God or for the love of God? Are you doing this to really share God's joy? Are you doing this to really bring forth life, peace? To create a certain amount of happiness? So this is for this reason I say it's not just a mere moral correctness or moral or legal correctness. But the possession here 
and manifestation of the nine graces. Look how it's broken down. The nine graces, the nine fruit are, are listen, are transformed here into nine areas of grace that we should be exercising as we go along this journey, that we should be working with. So when we begin to look at it, and we're going to try to break it down tonight so that we can find that peace, the nine areas of grace. Let us look at love, joy, and peace. A character as an individual state. Love, joy, and peace. We define this into one. We bring this into one. Love, joy, and peace. Why am I saying this? What did Jesus came doing? Sharing the joys of true and sincere worship, giving unto us the peace that was needed, and bringing us again that we can one more time say, Abba Father. So we're looking here at this character, what it defines. It defines an inward state of man. How modest are you? How caring are you? Sometimes, you know, we find this in our own homes. We find this ups and downs and this breaking up and all the rest of it in our own homes sometimes. And this again is because we are not exercising those three graces. That is so important. That is so important. And as we look at what Paul said, again, he continued to define as what he said in, I'm going to take you to Ephesians 5 and 9 of what the fruit of the Spirit really is about. Hear what he says. The fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. This is how Paul defines it. And this is in Ephesians 5, chapter 5, verse 9. The fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. When we think about this, as we begin to meditate upon this, it's supposed to really bring our lives in a certain way that, that God will be able to work with us and through us and in us. Important here to know. So that as we go along this journey, we will not find ourselves faltering because again, this grace I, I characterize these three graces here is an inward state. And we're going to try to break them down, but I want to give you this, this highlight here. Long suffering and goodness. Character is, in, listen, is in expression towards men. This is how, this is how it's defined. Long suffering, gentleness and goodness is an expression of your love and character. It is of your love towards your fellow human being. You know, sometimes we pass people on the street and we know that they are in, no, let, let me do it like this. You are walking down the street, rain is falling. And sometimes, you know, this car will pass you. He see the pool of water, but for whatever, I, sometimes it's mine, I don't know. Or if it's just wicked, he will drive through that water and, you are just on your way maybe to an appointment for a job or some kind of thing. And, you know, think about what you are feeling here and there. Oh, Lord, I'm late for this appointment. I'm late for this interview. And he just drives through that water carelessly, not even thinking. And may I say, sometimes he himself is going through changes in life. He sees the water, but yet he didn't see the water because of all that is on his mind. And in your mind and in your heart, what are the things that you are saying? What are the things that you are wishing on him? And not for a moment did you say, have mercy, Lord. Because remember, long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness is an expression of your love and character or Christian character towards human being. And you know, sometimes we don't exercise this. We don't share that joy. But it is important for us to do this. But when we look at the other tree that is so important, faith, meekness, and temperance. Faith, 
meekness and temperance. This is a true picture of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're going to see this as we go through these lessons. And I'm asking you, in the love of God and through his Holy Spirit, to get back into these words and to, to really seek to enjoy them because it's life. And if we truly apply them, we are going to be able to do much more than we are doing. So I am going to take you for a little walk in the word tonight. What does the Bible say about the fruit of the Spirit? I already shared Ephesians 9, Ephesians 5 and verse 9 with you. And I would wish you would make notes of some of these areas here. Now I want to take you to Matthew 3. I want you to see something here that is so important to us. Matthew 3, and it's, I think it's verse 8 that I want to read for you tonight. Matthew 3 and verse 8. And all we are dealing with is the spirit, the gift of the spirit. So let us look at this. Matthew 3 and verse 8. Bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. This is the call. You know, oh, ye generation of vipers who have warned you to flee from the wrath that is to come. He said, bring forth fruit, meat that is worthy for repentance. Our daily lives should be a life of confession. Our daily lives should be a life of seeking to, to walk in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our daily life should be a life of forgiveness. Our daily life should be one that is going to create the joy and peace within ourselves. That the moment death should step in, we would be able to say, Oh, death, where is thy sting? And oh, grave, where is thy victory? We must be able to say, Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit. It is because of this, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And most of all, this is a Lenten season. Whether you, 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 you celebrate Lent or not, it is a time that most of the world is truly coming into memory, memory of all the reveling that was done a few weeks ago. You know, all not, they're seeking repentance. They're seeking to be repented. They're seeking to be cleansed from all of this. But you don't go performing and then you just come back. This is what the law was all about. You see, with the law, you could have done anything. And when the time came for you to bring that sacrifice and hand it over to the high priest for him to offer it up for you, then you are free to go back and do all that you previously done, had done. And you know, we are making this a practice today rather than seeking to come out of it. So after you do all that you had done, now you go and you take ashes on Wednesday and you tell yourself, I'm clean again. And this is really the symbol of the bull, the red bull. We don't understand that sometimes. But this is what it is. You kill the bull, you sprinkle the blood, you sprinkle the water, and oh, I'm clean. So I'm good for another year until the time come again. And even within that year, I'm preparing to revel again. Against the nine graces that we are going to speak of here. Remember, the nine graces here symbolize as fruit. Fruit. Bring forth fruit. Bring forth fruit. And the fruit here is all to Jesus I surrender. The fruit here is all to him I freely give. The fruit here is have thine own way in my life, Lord. So when we begin to see these things, friends and family in the Lord, the joy, the love, joy, and peace, which again is the characteristic of an inward state. How do you feel towards your fellow men? You know, and, and I've seen this even in our religious organizations. Don't play with this one, you know, or don't deal with this one because of this and because of that. Listen, we have a power. We have an advocate. We have one who is in authority. And this is what we have to exercise, the joy and peace of service. 
It's a nice thing, you know. As we were told, if your enemy hungry, feed him. And we were told that you are heaping coals of fire on his head. I am not sure if we understand what that means. But it really means that you are interfering with his conscience, you know. Paul went so far to say, if your conscience condemn you, you are well condemned. And imagine you have done so much wrong to me, but yet still you are thirsty and I'm able to lift your head up and give you that glass of water in the name of Jesus. How important is this? And then they're looking you in the eye now. They could hardly do what they want to do. And they're saying, sorry, brother, sorry. And you don't know what they're saying sorry for, but it's no business of yours. Let him go. Give him that freedom to travel and to travel freely. And this is what Jesus is doing here. Even on the cross. I want you to understand what I'm trying to say. That even on the cross, those who persecuted him, those who pierced him, those who put the crown of thorn upon his head, those who whip him with cat and nine tails to the end of it. I like the area where he met Veronica and Veronica in tears and crying, feeling the burden of a mother that we men couldn't feel, but she felt it. But his words to her, because of the love of the Father and the purpose for which he came. He said, Veronica, weep not for me, but for yourselves and for your children. And I wonder what that mother felt when you're looking at your Lord and Savior under the cross with a crown of thorns on his head, his back and body and blood, and yet still, out of love, remember what I said, out of love he is now saying to you, Veronica, weep not for me, but for yourself and for your children. How do you feel? And the man standing by and, and pushing them away and saying, leave him alone. And today we are doing that. Look at our men today. We are so macho that even the church is being filled with the women and we cannot find the men. And the few that are there, they are taking some stands in life that, and they sell themselves out. They sell themselves out. You know, as I speak this, I remember I sat home going through this lesson and asking God, help me to take it from a different angle rather than the same angle that, that the whole way that, because you said this is, a, this is like a dough, it evolves. And I remember the first time I sat in a Congress meeting, there was a woman, two women there, Archbishop Randu, and another woman, I forget her name, Mundy, Archbishop Mundy. You know, and these two women came to mind today. I was young and innocent, not knowing. So when I, I reached there and, and addressing everybody, I, I shook Archbishop Mundy's hand and I said, Good afternoon, mother. And she looked me in the eye and she said, I'm Archbishop Mundy. And with meekness and humility, I said, I'm sorry. Archbishop Randu, the same thing. Because, I, you know, it's not the manner in which I was brought up. But after they took me outside, the both of them, and said, son, we know that this office doesn't belong to us. But the men are not doing nothing, so I have, we have to stand up and I bless them. Now, this is serious. This is serious. And they have done so much. They have brought us so much light. But they acknowledge that this office doesn't belong to me. And I respect them for that. And this is what is happening here. Where were the men when Veronica 
wipe the face of our Lord and Savior. And the mystery that took place this Lenten season, where his face was printed out on that towel. We men fighting against each other. But I want you men, my brethren, to remember what Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy 16 and 16 says. And when we can apply that area to our lives, what is going to happen? We are going to be expressing the joy here, which is going to be our natural inward character towards each other. You know, we are so hurried to pull each other down. And this is not what God wants for us. I am asking today that we bring ourselves to this point, you know, so that we can exercise the next area of, of the gifting, of the grace. And remember, I said, while it is nine fruit, I said nine graces. Accept them for what they are. And if these graces are manifesting in you and I, we are going to have a better joy in the service of, of Christ. So long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. Master, no man can do these things except be God be with him. Why call me good master? Because no man could do these things that thou doest except God be with him. So as we begin to look into all of this, Jesus is fulfilling this work of faith here. And as we look at John, the book of John, the 15th chapter, I want to read the 16th verse, but I want to go back to the fifth, from the very beginning. I want you to see something here that is so important. And as we begin to read the six, verses 16 and 17, it's really telling us something. He said, and I will pray. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm on the 14th chapter there. I want to go to the 15th. Yes, the 16th, right. So the 16th verse. He said, you have not chosen me. This is important here. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit. I'm dealing with fruit. And the fruit here is what you express, what you do in the spirit. Go ye therefore into all the world. He said, and lo, I am with you always. And baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He said, bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may, not shall, but he may give it you. These things I command you that ye love one another. There was a reason why I blend the two verses. This fruit that we're speaking of, you know, I'm so tired. You know, I'm so weary. You know, I'm, I'm this. You, we have all the excuses. But just remember, you did not choose him. He chose you so that you can bring forth fruit, meat worthy of repentance, and that the Father will bless you because of your good work and all that you do. Look at what verse 5 says of the same 15 chapter of St. John. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, what do we mean by this? What does it mean to abide? It means to stay. You know, we, we join the faith and, you know, I, I'm sorry in so many ways for some of the things that I am seeing. You came, you baptized, you went through the process of taking spiritual heights, and then all of a sudden, when the trials or the proving of your faith step forward in your life, 
You begin to give up. You bow out. You say, I can't deal with this. Now, I want to ask a question here tonight. I want to ask a question here tonight. I want to ask a question here tonight. And let us think about what it is. Let us think about what it is. Sorry about that. Call me later. I'm on my program right now. Yes. I want you to think about what it is. I want you to understand where we are. I did not choose, you did not choose me, but I choose you. I love you from the very beginning. I choose to lay my life down for you. I choose to give my heart so that you will know that I am God and that beside me there is none other. And here he is saying, if you abide in me and I in you, listen, and I in him, this is beautiful. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same shall bring forth much fruit. Now, I, I love this because it's really speaking to us. And what we are going to do, we are going to look at the fruit. You know, the fruit, as a matter of fact, you know, sometimes, or the, the, the graces, as a matter of fact, because sometimes what we, we have excuses. You know, I'm too old. I'm so tired. You know, I'm not a preacher. You know, I'm not this and I'm not that. And you know, we have all the excuses. You know, I can't do this and I can't do that. I'm not as bright as you. You don't have to be as bright as me because if we go back into the lessons and we remember those who sacrificed for us, they could not even read or write, but their dependency was in the right place. They did not have a template, but they depended on the Holy Spirit. And they were led. Today we have become so intellectual that the Holy Spirit cannot speak to us anymore. And I'm fearful of that. Hear what it says here in Galatians 4 and 5. Four, five Galatians 4 verses 5 and 6. Hear what it says. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Continue, I'm reading the sixth verse. And because ye are sons, God has set forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. When we understand this, we'll be able to work with what God has said here for us. You shall bring forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. One of the things that I'd like to say here, I just, rem just remember what that says, without me you can do nothing. So don't come to stand before God without seeking him. Ask of me, and whatsoever you ask, it shall be done. I am calling out to you. I am asking you. I am seeking your face. And I'm asking God to have his own way in your life so that you can be all that God wants you to be. So that you will be able to walk in his will and perform his mercies, his love and his mercy, and be able to receive from him the things that he has in store for us. Now, are you too old? Or is it that you are lackadaisical? Now I'm asking these questions because the scripture is going to speak. Remember what I said? What the Bible says about the fruit of the spirit. So we see here, we're talking about spiritual fruit. And the spiritual fruit here, and you know, when you speak of the fruit of the womb, you're talking about bringing forth giving birth to a child. So we are looking here now at the fruit of the Spirit and the last great commission that was given unto us according to Matthew 28 verses 19 through 20. 
He said, go ye therefore into all the world and preach the everlasting gospel and baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The last great commandment with a promise and lo, I am with you always, even unto the very end. It is important for us to really take these things seriously. You see, and I'm not just coming here to preach spirit to you and to shout down the place. When the time comes for us to shout, we will shout, let us shout. You know, as I see today, we cannot shout without a mic in our hands. You know, and I, it, it makes me smile sometimes because it, it takes me right back to our elders. If I remember carefully, you know, there was a guy they called Bishop Esdell. When he began to shout, you could stand up and to the end of Suku Trace and hear him from all up on the next end of Suku Trace. No, you can't shout without a mic in your hands. Are we walking the graces of God? Is it resting upon us? Well, where are we today? We have to ask ourselves these questions. And I'm not interested in who you are, what position you stake, but let us think about where we are. Are we uplifting the faith or breaking it down? Sometimes when you hear these men shouting, you, you, you come in, you want to know what it is. It's like music to your ears. Now you can't shout without a mic. I don't want you to think again. Let us look back at our elders. We must never forget our legacy. You know, as I sat there today and I'm, I'm listening to the Prime Minister of Barbados giving a speech in South Africa and repeating Dr. Stalin's words. And what was it? We can do it if we try. When I heard her say that, I smiled, I laughed. And truly, where are we today if we are lifting the spirit? We must understand what, yes, we, the increase of technology and all the rest of it. But let us not give up on our total background. And this is where we are today. We are giving up on these things. We are no longer exercising in them. And this is what it says here. So the elders just sitting down there like, like mummies now because they're confused, they don't know how to go, and you're not even trying to help them along the way. And we have to understand what it means. Long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. Are we working with them? Or you old man, you old time? This was, we are. Well, what was is? And without what was, you cannot be who you are. And this is what the love of God, the, the nine graces, is hereby speaking to us. We have to understand this and walk in it so that we can find that peace, church. Otherwise, we are lost. Walking in our own ways and our own insights. I'm going to try to take you to Psalm 92. And I want you to see something here. You are not old. You are not weakened. And nothing has been taken away. Though some of us feel, well, we, we so young and we know it, an and old timer, old timer. But I want to share something with you. Without them, we have nothing. Without them, the faith is empty. I want to say this to you. They were not walking intellectually, but they were walking divinely led. And today I want to say so many of us are not even receiving from the spirit. We're doing things because it feels good and because it looks good. But no, if we abide in the graces that was handed down to us, we will be able through the grace and mercy of God, through the good grace and mercies of God to really bring forth fruit. And hear what it says here in Psalm 92. I'm going to read verses 13 and 14. Psalm 92. Now this is why I said, what does the Bible say about the fruit? And how important it is for us to understand what the fruit is all about. 
And how can we receive the true blessings of the fruit? Let me read one verse for you from the 15th chapter of St. John, again, the seventh verse. He says, if ye abide in me, and my word abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Hearing is my Father glorified, oh yeah, that ye bear much fruit and ye be my disciples. Hearing is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, and ye be my disciple. Look at what the 92nd Psalm says, the 13th and 14th verse. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the court, <clears throat> excuse me, in the court of our God. I want to take this verse by verse. Those that be planted. You know how all in a sudden church, we just change everything. We're not even trying to modernize. We just change everything. I don't want this no more and I don't want that no more. You don't want that. Does the spirit tell you that? Did the spirit, because of some intellectual who might stand up and say these things, were you guided by him or by the spirit? You know, according to the book of Ephesians, the great work and the mysterious work that was being done, was it done according to the flesh or was it done according to the spirit? This book of Ephesians is very powerful. And I think if we listen to it carefully and understand what it's really saying to us, we are going to find a great peace. So we are being told here, those that be planted, you know, we used to have something we call spiritual arrest. You know, today men are telling you when you could go before God, you know, it's time for you to go before God. You know, What are we doing? Where are we? We have become so powerful today. We are weak in many ways. And as I would always say, we have good choreographers. People who could design and plan and make things happen, which is good. We need them. But let our dependency be on the Holy Spirit. And utilize the talents of the youths that is coming up. Utilize it to the fullest. But also let them know that your dependency is on God. So that whatever they put their hands to, wherever they set their mind, they would be seeking God. And if God approves it, it's well approved. So my calling to you to tonight is not to pull you down. It's not to make you less than, but to help us to understand what these nine graces and we could go further on into the areas of, of the scripture, you know, and see what it says. We could preach on this from now till the end of the year. But I just want to highlight here to you how important adhering to the word is. He said, those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of the Lord. Now, it's not everybody could be in the courts of the Lord. Today, we don't care about it. Anybody being anything. You know, as we grew up, there were certain things and a line of encouragement, a line of incentive. You know, it, it gives, you know, as a, as a baptized, a child who is not yet baptized, we don't give them communion. It's an incentive to encourage them to desire. It's not that they cannot receive it. And I don't want you to think that they cannot receive it. The body and blood of Christ is for each and every one of us. But we had given them an opportunity to desire to grow. And as a baptized person, you know, there are certain areas and things you, you were not allowed to do. You were not even allowed to get there. So what, what that does, it creates a curiosity. It creates a desire in you because I want to be there. Today, we break that down. We have even moved the mercy seat out of churches. No more mercy seat. Oh, that was all time. And we have to think again, church. We truly have to sit back and think and, 
And really, you know, and those of us who are breaking down the mercy seat now, they sat on mercy seat and that's where they get the greatest inspiration. Why are we denying them that now? Why are we taking that away from them? And I'm asking this question across the board. Because there are those who are sitting back and murmuring and not asking this question. But these graces of God should not be denied from anybody. And it should be a blessing. We ought to uplift. Planted in the courts. And I want you to deal with this word in the courts of the Lord. You do not go, and, and let's take it from a carnal point of view, you do not go in the high court if you do not have a pass and a badge. I had to go into a building on, on Tuesday. And before I go into that building, they had to search me. This is where we are now. That, that, you know, the searching there remind me when our elders had on tall boots or leggings as we used to call them. And in the forest at nights, in obedience to God, to bring forth and to hold this faith, and they were singing, this faith shall never die. This is what they were saying. But today, we are breaking it down because we become so fashion conscious. Church, we're talking about the graces. The anointing that, that was given unto us through these garments of faith. Let us think about what we are doing in order to enter into certain... You see, the, the places that, that Aaron could have had gone, and don't tell me about they were priests in those days, there it's the same principle now. And it's the same principle in every life. You don't take an a, a intern to do a heart surgery. You'll have the intern at the, at the side of the doctor to perform that heart surgery. And to do that heart surgery, we need interns who are more or less experienced because this is a technical thing. So all of a sudden, you just take every and anybody into the inner court who don't know what they're doing. They're moving according to the song because it's so good. But when the time of problem should come, no one can help the time. We need to speak about this. Don't only come here and tell me hallelujah. Let us see where we are breaking down rather than building. So when we can understand this, and this is what it says here, to enter into the courts of the Lord. This is where certain, you know, imagine, I remember Asuras, the king, when Esther had to go in unto him, she couldn't just go in. And they had their rules in those days. We're talking about biblical days. Because when he sat on that judgment seat or his seat of authority, you cannot just walk in that court. You have to have permission. But it reached here a point where my sister Esther said, if I die, I die. Why? It was because of the children of Israel was about to be placed at stake when Naaman decided, listen, Haman, as a matter of fact, not Naaman, Haman, they wanted to pass a decree. And she said, you know, when Mordecai spoke to her, he said, well, you could feel as powerful as you are, you know, and this is what is happening to some of us. We sit in certain position and we feel powerful. But he said, we feel as powerful as you are. But I want you to remember you are still a Jew. You are still a Hebrew. And when the decree is passed, it's going to pass on you. Well, she made up her mind. She said, if I die, I die. And when she stood at the entrance and he lifted his head and saw her, he raised his scepter with permission for she to come. Even though she was the love of his life, he had the right to behead her immediately because she was not supposed to be here. So what I'm saying to you, I'm pointing to you the courts. I'm not moving away from our lesson. The courts. You don't just, not anybody and anyone can enter into the courts of our God. And this is why we used to have children. They will be sleeping and they would have a spiritually arrested. 
and they would be crying out in the spirit and saying, call mother this and, and call leader this and take me by leader this now. And when you do so and you go in to meet leader this, leader this, get up from his bed and he come in to meet you and all you're meeting in the midway. That was spiritual things. Today we kill that. And leader this didn't ask in you, well, who, who tell you? Or how did you get that? No, leader this and that was ready. He know what to do. And if it means taking you to the water right away, he will take you to the water right away. And this is how important this is. And don't come and tell me that God has changed. God hasn't changed. Those graces have not changed. Those graces remains the same and the time has come for us to walk in the grace of God we have become so filthy because of that lucre and how much you can pay and how much you can receive but what does it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and suffer the loss of his own soul I am asking you tonight to consider this you say, I'm too old. I can't, you know, I, my body weak now. But I want to share this with you. They shall bring the 14th verse of the 92nd chapter. They shall bring forth fruit in all age. They shall be fat and flourishing. Look at those who are carrying the message. Look at those who continue to labor in the field. Look at those who continue to work for Jesus. You know, sometimes when we get the opportunity to exercise in the faith, we allow fear. But I don't even want to go into the book of Revelation to show you the place. There is a place for the fearful. This place is serious. And you don't want to be in that place because it burned with, it's a lake of fire. A place set aside for the fearful. So when you are called to say something in church or, or do something for the Lord, oh, not me, you begin to pull aside. I want you to think again. I want you to understand. And I think that is in, in, in Revelation 22 and 8, somewhere there, where it says there is a place for the fearful. And we have to be very careful. We have to be very careful in those areas. Hear what it says, it's 21 and 8. Allow me to read it for you. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Sometimes we tell a lie and we feel it's just a simple lie. But it's not. So again, remember, the laziness, the tardiness, that we don't want to take that time to read. We have to strengthen ourselves and our spirit so that we can bless God in all things. And never mind how old you may be, never mind how weak you may be, you have a message. You know, I have a sister who is on a bed of affliction and she would be telling you certain things and she would be giving God praise even though she is on that bed of affliction. I want you to know this. I want you to accept these areas here. Hear what it says here, church. The 14th verse of Psalm 92. They shall bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock. And there is no unrighteousness in him. So sometimes when you see the elders. And they, they have the joy. And, and they're moving in such a way. And you sit in church. You know we come to church. And we sit there. No incentive to do anything. But I am calling out to you. I am asking you tonight. To look to God, believe in Jesus, trust him for his word, and let him have his way in your life. 
We're going into a little areas here, a little area here that is so important to us. And this is fruit we're dealing with. Perennial, P-E-R-E-N-I-N-A-L, perennial, meaning enduring fruit. Fruit that don't die. You know, there are those who have come and gone and today we could remember them as I remembered, you know, as Bishop Mundy. I must have saw her about twice, but it, the conversation that we had, I would never forget it. I don't know what you know about her and I don't care. But the moment and time that we had together, she shared with me a good word. Archbishop Randu, the respect that they gave to me and, and shared with me, may they live forever. And she is the one who really said it. I didn't want this office, but the men are not doing what they're supposed to do. And she was right. Go out and see where we are. See what we are doing and recognize what Deuteronomy 16 and 16 says. And if we would apply ourselves, you know, a good man died today, last night, as a matter of fact, and that brother was, was really, I loved him. Archdeacon Garnet Dash from Tobago. You know, he passed on last night and I say, may he find peace with God, you know, and I believe because from his life, from the things that came out of him, I don't know what he did in secret and it has nothing to do with me. But a little that I know of him, I knew he loved the Lord. And he was honest. Not one who will tell a lie. Like I remember someone, they receive a phone call and it says uh, X, Y, and Z. And then when I question it, he said, well, I only hear this when I was walking up this step here. Well, I now hear this. Stop lying. But I know you get the phone call. I know the message was passed on. And then in, somewhere along the lines now, we just forget. And, and, and we just boast. I just know everything, you know. So we have to, we have to understand. And, and he was not one of those. From my perspective. And this is all I can say. God is a judge. But I say to his family on this program here, may his fruit live on. One who was on that, always on a prayer channel and will send out a prayer continually. May God rest his soul in peace. So we're talking here about perennial fruit. Enduring fruit is what I'm talking about. Enduring fruit. And as we are about to go into this, because you know the time flies. Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel chapter 47. And I want to read from the 12th verse. And we're going to spend a little minute there. We're going to spend a little minute there. You know, from the throne of God, there is a, a there is a what there's a stream of water that flows. <clears throat> Excuse me. From the right side of the throne of God. And we are told that that water, it will revive the Dead Sea and all that. Nothing cannot live there right now. It's going to live. And all the marshland, according to Ezekiel 47 and 48. All the marshland is going to be revived. I'm saying something to you, church. Understand we are in a time when the Gentiles are in control of the world. And they are exercising power. I said last week or week before, the hermetic race had their time. And they failed. The scripture says they failed. The Semitic race had their time and they failed to achieve all that they had that was there before them. And the time has come when the Gentile era is in full force, when Gog and Magog will be coming down. Open your eyes. 
see where we are. You know, I heard one said, well, the same thing happening in, 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 in America is the same thing happening all over the world. I want you to think again. Be very careful. Observe the things that we are experiencing. The diseases that is happening. You know, and the things that is coming down the pike. And when you sit back and you listen carefully, you're going to hear the song. As the revelator says, the circle is completed. The circle is completed. Finland and Poland had joined. The circle is completed. I repeat that. And I know that to many it seems as nothing, but the circle is complete. The Gentile power is going to do what they have to do. But good graces, God in his mercy, Deuteronomy 30 is going to be speaking. He's going to, God is going to do what he has to do and he's going to reach, gather his people. He is going to gather his people. But hear what is happening, church. And by the river, the 12th verse of the 47th chapter, of Ezekiel. And by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall go trees for meat, whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because the waters there is the issued out of the sanctuary and the fruit thereof shall be for meat and the leaf thereof for medicine. And in many cases, we are confused with the spiritual working or the mystery of the Holy Spirit who said to us, the mystery of the Holy Spirit was that the Holy Spirit will teach you things to come. So sometimes when we begin and we say, well, listen, everything is written. I want to tell you something. The things that is to come is not going to defy or, or make this Bible a liar. No, this is the book. But whatever is to come is going to help you to understand the true foundation of this Bible. When the Holy Spirit can tell you, go and pick up this and pick up that and, and use it for certain diseases and heal your body, I want you to know it is important that we take the time to really understand what God is saying to us. You are God's children. And in God, there is life. And in him, there is hope. And I am calling out to you to remember what it says here. In due season, in the book of Revelation, it tells you every month, the book, the, the, these trees from this bank, the boat bank, this side and that side, will bring forth fruit. Now, I don't know how wide the river is. I don't know how long the river is. I don't know how deep the river is. But God has a way that we are going to be able to enjoy the fruit. And it is in their season. So this is our season to really seek to know God and to know him more. And to understand what the fruit of God is really in our lives. So let your light so shine that men may see your good work and be able to glorify the Father which is in heaven. Trust him for his good grace. Trust him for his mercy. Live and abide in his word. And you will understand what he is saying to you and what he is saying to me. So tonight, 
I wish you would go back and read these lessons and that the Holy Spirit will manifest and share with you the joy of these words. And you're never too old. Never mind where you are. If your faith is in Christ, in your old age you will bring forth fruit. Meat worthy of for repentance. You will be fattened in your old age. You will be strengthened with joy. You will be able to call someone your grandson and say, well, go tell so-and-so, don't go on the road this morning. You can't move, you can't walk because you have arthritis in every joint of your body. But that doesn't retain, it doesn't despise the working of God, Holy Spirit in your life. So may God bless you all tonight. May God make his face to shine upon you. May God grant you all the peace, that peace which passeth all understanding. I am asking you to stand firm. I am thanking God for you all tonight. And may his blessing rest upon us all in the name of Jesus. We thank God for you. We bless God for you. And I ask you to be mindful of all that he has for you. God bless. Have a good night, one and all. Peace in Christ Jesus.